And join me in John chapter 16. John chapter number 16. As we continue our journey through the Gospel of John, closing in uh, on those final hours, uh, chapter 16 begins with these words. It says, These things have I written unto you. So what are these things? These things have I written, or, or really what he means there is that I have spoken to you. These things I have shared with you. These things refer to the things that he's been telling them for the two previous chapters. He has warned them that of the difficult days ahead, but he's also promised them a comforter, the Holy Spirit, that would come and help them through. So he says, it's going to get tough, but, but don't be discouraged because I'm going to help you through it. Okay, And so we have the warning there, but we also have the comfort. Uh, and so as John chapter 16 begins, we start to see a little more about what the role of that comforter is, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see the role that He's going to play, uh, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those that are in the world. And the first role that we see that He focuses in on is, is what He's going to do to help them through a time of persecution. Jesus did not hide, and He has not hidden, and it should not be hidden from us. The church is going to face persecution. You know, one of the biggest things that we see right now is, is we've had an administration change and all of that stuff, and any, it happens every time. Anytime there's a change in government or a change in leadership or whatever, we always worry about persecution. We always worry about what's going to happen to the church. Well, let me let you in on a secret, church. Persecution is coming. If it's not this four years, it'll be the next four years. Or the, but, but as we get closer and closer to the Lord's return, it's coming. We're going to face it. All right, And by the way, we don't look at it, but a lot of the persecution we're going to face is, yes, there's some of it out there, but we're facing persecution from within. Some of the biggest obstacles the church has to overcome are itself. We get in our own way. We, we set up our own persecution. But the Holy Spirit, He's going to send to help them through this difficult time. And He begins by talking to them about this conflict that's coming. That's the one thing I love about the teaching of Jesus. He doesn't hide it. How many have ever been recruited for anything? Anybody? Like for a team, for a job, or anything? Anybody been recruited? How many of you are awake? How many of you are frozen? It's, it's, it's warm in here. It's frozen outside. It's warm in here. You should have thawed out by now. But if you're being recruited, the recruiter's going to tell you all the good things. I remember when, when Zach went into the uh, National Guard, I remember going and sitting there with the recruiting office, and, and, and I remember several months later, Angie and I sitting there go, that ain't what he told us. <laughs> you know, their job was what? Get them to sign up, you know? So tell them all the good things. Tell them all these things. Get them to sign up. And so um, that, that's just the tendency of what we want to do. I'm, if I want you to join me, I'm not going to tell you the bad things. But Jesus does. Why? Because he doesn't just want followers. He wants true followers. And so, yeah, he tells them the good, but he tells them the bad. And so look at the conflict that's coming uh, in verses 1 through 4. It says, These things have I spoken or written unto, or spoken unto you uh, that you should not be offended. They shall uh, put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that, the, that I told you them, that these uh, things I said unto, not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. And so as Jesus is speaking to them, He says, I have spoken these to you. As He's Talking to us, He has what? Written them to us. So uh, they've been spoken to, we've been written to, but we've all received the information that He's sharing. And so He begins this preparation. He says He's sharing these things that they be not offended. 
Translated, that means that they are not disheartened. What Jesus is saying is, I am telling you these things so when they happen, you will be prepared for them. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to throw in the towel. I don't want you to be caught off guard. So I'm telling you they're coming, so when they happen, you're not going to be disheartened. You will say, I, I, I knew that was coming. Now, whether you prepared for that coming or not, that's up to you. But if you knew it was coming, then you ought to be prepared. Other translations say that he has done this to keep them from falling away. In other words, he doesn't want to lose them over this persecution. And we see that in the church today. People come and the preacher will preach this message and say that life is all sunshine and roses after you get saved. And then the first negative thing that comes up that they face they leave the faith. I didn't know it was going to be that hard. Well, listen to me. It's going to be hard. <laughs> he had not explained this to them before, he says in verse 4, as he repeats this same statement, adding a little bit of detail. He said, I didn't explain this to you before because I was with you. Now, while he was with them, the world's persecution was not focused on them. The world's persecution was focused on him. They were worried about Jesus, not so much his disciples, as we've read so far through the book of John. Well, now that he's leaving, that persecution would now be directed to the disciples as they continued the ministry. With Jesus not here, they couldn't focus in on Jesus, so they focused in on those that continued to share the word of Jesus. He also would not be there when they faced this persecution personally. So he's preparing them. He's not going to be there to hold their hand. He's not going to be there to give them the guidance and to give them the direction. And so he's preparing them for this time to come. You might ask yourself, well, well what's coming? What is this persecution? We see there in verses 2 and 3. It says they will be thrown out of the synagogue. And by the way, this was the mildest action. Just simply, they would, would, would just kick them out. You're not welcome here anymore. Now, we saw that happen with the man that Jesus healed. He came in and, and dancing all around the city. They, they just kicked him out. And so uh, that, that's the least of the worries. You're just not welcome in the temple anymore. You're not welcome in the synagogue anymore. Go away. But not only would they be thrown out of the synagogue, they would be thrown out of the system. He said, what do you mean by system? Look around you, folks. A lot of what happens in the church and around of the church is, is a religious system. It, this is the more severe response. They would become outcast. They will be persecuted for what they believe and teach because what they believe and teach was different from tradition. As I shared with you what they're facing in Utah, some pastors, some preachers don't like the work that's going on there because it's different than what they're used to. You go overseas and, and you're preaching the gospel and, and somebody gets saved. These people that are getting saved, they can be shut out of their own family, sometimes even killed, because what they're now learning and what they're now teaching and what they're now believing is different than what their tradition was. It's different from the system. How many of you have ever had something happen in the church? You say, well, I don't know how I feel about that. Why? Because it was different from tradition. How many of you like your traditions? You know how to know whether you're married to your traditions? How much time did you spend complaining last year when Thanksgiving and Christmas rolled around and a lot of the things that you would normally do you weren't able to do? That'll tell you right there how married we are. We're people that are married to traditions. We like that comfort. We like going through those things. But this new faith in Jesus broke that tradition. People won't even take time to consider what they're saying. They don't want to hear it. It's different, so I don't want to hear it. The worst part is those persecuting, and even some going as far as to kill them, were doing it while claiming the name of God. We're, going, we're doing this in the name of God. And probably the greatest example of that is the Apostle Paul we've been studying on Wednesday nights. If you'll remember when Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to persecute Christians, to arrest them, to take them in. And he said he was doing the work of God. 
He thought he was doing right by God because he had not accepted the true faith in Jesus Christ. He hadn't understood it. But when Jesus got a hold of his heart, it changed him, didn't it? Before his conversion, Paul, he was a zealous man. He was a godly man, thought he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, but he was misguided, misled. Jesus makes it clear they may say that they are doing God's service. But verse 3 says they don't know God and they don't know me. How do we know? Because if they knew God and they knew him, they would not be persecuting the church. Amen? He then moves from the conflict to the concern. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. So what we see here is they're distracted in verse 5. Early in his ministry, when Jesus spoke of him leaving, his departure, uh, both Peter and Thomas kind of half-heartedly asked, where are you going? Uh, Assuming that he's uh, heading to another earthly destination. But Jesus has now made it very clear that he's not heading to some earthly destination. He's talking about leaving this world. He's talking about going to be with the Father. Even with this truth out there, they are more distracted with the consequences on themselves than they are where Jesus is going. Jesus said, I've been telling you that I'm leaving, and you're not even asking me where I'm going. All you're worried about is what's going to happen to you. All you're worried about is is, uh, the impact that's going to, or the consequences that's going to happen to you because I'm leaving. Jesus is saying that they're self-centered. They lack concern. And boy, doesn't that happen in the faith. We want to serve Jesus as long as everything's going right. But as soon as things start going wrong, we're more worried about what's happening to us than we are about serving Him. We're more worried about what the impact on us than we are doing His will. Jesus said, you're not even asking. Why? What was behind them being distracted? They were distraught. They have failed to focus on any of the positive that would be coming out of Jesus' departure. All they were focused on was the void that this would leave. We have followed this man. We have learned for three years this has been our best friend, our mentor, our master, our guide, our director, everything that we've needed he has provided. And now he's gone. But what should have brought them joy, the next step in the redemptive plan of God. They didn't see it as that. It was actually bringing them sorrow because they were distracted by self-pity. They didn't see things in the bigger picture. They didn't see that it was necessary for Jesus to go. It was necessary for Him to die. It was necessary for Him to pay that price. All they were worried about is what's going to happen to them once He leaves. And then we come down to the role of the Holy Spirit. This is the amazing thing to me. Every problem they're having, they're distracted, they're distraught. Whose fault is that? It's theirs. They're the ones not paying attention. They're the ones not listening to what Jesus is trying to tell them. They're the ones focusing on the negative instead of focusing on the positive. But even with that, out of the love that Christ has for us, He says, look, I'm even going to help you through that. He says, I'm going to send a comforter. Look at verse 7. We see the provision. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. And if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. You see, Jesus is aware of the sorrow. He understands what's going on. He understands the problem that they have with his upcoming departure. He understands that the sorrow that it's going to cause his disciples. But he tells them, look, it's expedient. Or in other words, it's to your advantage that I go. Stop looking at this negatively and look at what positive is going to come out of the fact that I'm leaving. How many of you have had a child at home 
Mom and Daddy's leaving for work. I don't want you to go to work. We have that with grandkids now. You know, Zach or Alicia will drop them off at the house. and Well, Dad's got to go to work. I don't want you to go to work. They want him there. Well, that's great. That's nice. It's nice to have that love. But anybody know what's going to happen if he doesn't go to work? <laughs> when you're homeless living on the street, you go wish Daddy had went to work. Amen? But I don't see that part. So that's what Jesus, let me let, me let you in on the, what needs to happen. He says, let me let you in. It is expedient for you. He said, it is beneficial for you that I leave. It's to your advantage. Because he says, if I don't go, then the Holy Spirit doesn't come. Well, at first you might think, no big deal. We'll, we'll, we'll trade you for the Holy Spirit. But then he begins to, to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit. He does not tell them why, but he simply says that if he doesn't go, he can't come. But if we read the Scriptures, we know why. Because the Holy Spirit cannot come until Jesus has finished what he has come to do. In order for him to become the payment for sin, he had to die that sacrificial bloody death on the cross. He could not become my payment for sin. He could not become my sacrificial lamb if he himself were not sacrificed. So it had to happen. It was only after that death that he would uh, then send the role or that we would see the new role of the Holy Spirit. Once he has uh, overcome death, hell, and the grave and gone back to be with the Heavenly Father, it was at that point that he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, would, this new role, would live within the believer. Jesus in his earthly ministry, walking as a man, could only be at one place at one time. So if Jeff's over there and Jesus is with Jeff, guess who he's not with? Now if the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells every one of us, every believer, no matter where Jeff is, he's got the Holy Spirit over there. No matter where I am, guess what? I've got the same God and the Holy Spirit. See the benefit of that? That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. There's a benefit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role is going to do something that I am not meant to do. Everybody had their role. Jesus' role was to be the sacrificial lamb. The Holy Spirit's role was to come and dwell us as believers and lead us and guide us through this life. You say, what makes one a believer? We become a believer as we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus on Calvary's cross. So if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, guess what? Everything else is for naught. The whole Old Testament church, their, all of their faith is built on what is going to happen on Calvary's cross. Everything that they've put their faith in is this future event of Jesus dying on the cross, becoming the sacrificial lamb. Now for the New Testament church, everything that we have looks back to the cross. All the faith that we have is what took place on the cross. But in the center of both the Old Testament church and the New Testament church, you find the cross. The cross is the answer. And so Jesus says, I have to do this. It is expedient for me to do this. It is to your advantage for me to do this. It's the only way that you're going to have a home in heaven is if I do this. Many things that we must face in this life that we don't understand or know why. But we can rest assured that God has a reason. There's a reason behind the things that God does in the life of believers. And so Jesus begins to list some of these as he lists the purposes here in verses 8 through 15. One of the purposes of the comfort of the Holy Spirit is to convict sinners. He says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go not to my Father and ye see me no more. We begin to see here that the role of the Holy Spirit will go beyond what He does for the believer. To the believer, He is an advocate, He is a comforter. However, to the world, He is an accuser and a prosecutor. 
He will expose their sin. In other words, He will show them that they're guilty. How do we know that we're guilty of sin? It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit within. Those of you that have been saved, you remember that day when somebody was talking to you about the gospel or you heard the gospel preached and that little feeling within inside of you and say, hey, I'm guilty of that. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit convicting the sinner. Not only will He convict the sinner by exposing their sin, but He will convince them of their sin. You know, it's not enough to know that their sin, you know, how many of you can think of five different people and point out their sin this morning? How many can point out five of your own sins this morning? <laughs> you know, it's a difference between knowing sin and knowing your sin. So it's a different and exposing sin and exposing your sin. We have to admit that we are sinners. Verse 9, we see the greatest need and obstacle to overcome. They do not believe in Jesus. Without faith, there is no salvation. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, to convict us that we're guilty. If we don't know that we have a disease, we'll never look for a cure. If we don't know that we are sinners in need of a Savior, we'll never look for a Savior. So that's the Holy Spirit's role within the sinner, to convict us of our guilt, to convict us of our need for forgiveness of that sin, which draws us to Christ. If you're here this, and you're saved this morning, you understand what I'm talking about. You, you might remember, I, I can still remember, uh, I mean, all the way in the back, about as far as I can go, I can remember those knuckles turning white, gripping that pew like, not today. Keep on preaching, preacher. Keep preaching to me. I don't care they're telling you all about my sins. I don't care if they wrote them down and you're preaching my life story to me. I ain't getting saved. I remember it. By the way, how many of you know ain't nobody told the preacher nothing about your sins? That's the Holy Spirit convicting you, ain't it? Number two is to condemn Satan of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Folks, the whole world will face judgment. If Satan, the prince of this world, will not escape judgment, what makes you think that you will? You can believe or don't believe that judgment is coming. That's why as believers, we don't need to spend time arguing with people. You present the facts. You present the case. It's up to them to decide what they're going to do with the case. It's like putting somebody on trial. If you're a witness or you're the prosecutor, what you're going to do is you're going to present the case to the jury. It's up to them to decide to do what, what they want to do with the case once you give it. Once you've given all the truth, that's all you can do. We will all face judgment. Everyone that rejects Jesus as Satan did will share the eternal doom that awaits Satan. Oh, and we live in a day where people laugh about that. Oh, I don't care. Send me to hell. I've seen signs on these pickets and all this, that, and the other, you know, uh, where, where they're uh, protesting this or that and the other, especially in front of the abortion clinic, just, just making mockery of God. You go ahead and mock him. Your judgment day's coming. You might think you're going to charge hell with a water pistol. You might think that hell is one great big party, but you're in for a surprise. And then we see another purpose is to counsel the saints. Look at verses 12 and 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. Jesus has many other things that he wants to tell them. He wants to share with them, but he says you're not able to handle them at this time. You're not mature enough. You don't have faith enough. You know, basically saying, look, you ain't listening to what I already told you. They were limited in their understanding. And part of that limitation was because they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. 
When they received the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost, He would guide them into truth. People ask you all the time, how do you know? I know because I know. Well, how do you get that? Because the Holy Spirit lives within me. I don't have to explain it. I just know this is true because the Bible says it's true. He reveals God's message to the believer. You hear people say, well, the Lord spoke to me. I, I've, never, I've never heard an audible voice from the Lord. Just never have. My personal opinion, I don't believe he works that way anymore. Doesn't need to. Why? Because we got all the word we need right here and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So what do I mean by when I say he talks to me? He talks to me through this book. He talks to me through prayer. He talks to me through the Holy Spirit. We've all had that time where we're praying and, and all of a sudden we're not even thinking about anything and, and, and we get to praying about something else. What was that? The Holy Spirit said, hey, you need to pray about this. We talk about being spirit-led. And then he says he will show them things to come. Now first on the agenda is the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. That's the next thing on the timeline. He was going to show them those things. They were going to see that happen. But second, he would reveal to the apostles future events affecting the church and the world. That's what we have with the rest of the New Testament. Those things, some things which are still yet to come. He has revealed to them. And then finally we see in verses 14 and 15, the Holy Spirit will champion the Savior. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive, be, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said he that, I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Back in verse 13, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would speak of him, would not speak of himself. Here he expands, letting us know that the Holy Spirit would always exalt and magnify the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit would communicate what both God the Father and God the Son Jesus had communicated to him. This is the same way it works today, and it gives us a picture of the true Trinity in tune. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all working together to bring us to God. God the Father sent His Son to be the sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And then sent the Holy Spirit to convict us that what happened on the cross is true and that we need to accept and believe that and put that in our heart and then through that, back through Jesus, back to the Father. It all works together perfectly in tune. That's how God has designed it. Think about it the next time that you pray. You pray to God, right? The Spirit leads you. Jesus gave you access to God. All of it works together. The hours are winding down and the teaching is getting more personal. While the disciples are troubled and burdened about the thought of Jesus coming, His coming departure, Jesus is trying to get their focus to where it should be. It's not something that was just going to happen or just happening. This had been planned from the beginning. This was always God's plan. Jesus knew His time with them was temporary, and the plans had already been laid out and, and for the next transition, taking the gospel to the world. Jesus' role was that of the sacrificial lamb. He who knew no sin becoming sin's payment. Now we're finding out a little bit more about the role of the Holy Spirit and you say, preacher, what, what, we already knew that. Did we? I'm going to tell you, sometimes by the way we act, I wonder if we do. He has come to convict the world of their sin and their need for a Savior. How does He convict them? 
through the gospel message. Who's supposed to carry the gospel message? We are. So if we really believed in the way that things were supposed to work, shouldn't we be doing our part? So if we're not sharing the gospel, we're saying, yes, we believe that the gospel is what's going to bring people to Christ through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus is going to build that bridge through His sacrifice back to God. We believe that's how it's supposed to be, but I'm just going to sit my part out. That's exactly what you're deciding to do when you will not share the gospel. You've decided to sit your part out. He has come to guide and direct the believer. By the way, that's only going to happen as we trust Him and believe Him. He can't guide us and direct us unless we follow. He has come to glorify and exalt Jesus in the hearts and minds of believers. This is done as we learn the Word, as we love the Word, and as we live the Word. If we won't spend time with God and won't learn about God, how can God be exalted? In short, Jesus has given us everything that we need. The question for us is, are we using what we've been given? Where is your relationship with Jesus? The sad, honest truth is that many find themselves distracted just as the disciples did. They're more focused on self than they are Savior. It's not comfortable for me to share the gospel. It's not comfortable for me to go to church. It's not comfortable for me to do this. It's not comfortable. We want to live in our comfort zone. How many of you have ever accomplished anything without stepping out of your comfort zone? Sometimes we just got to step out. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you to be crazy. You know, they're, 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 God gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. The problem is we got to listen to the Holy Spirit. So are we back to where we started on this? Abiding in Christ taking full advantage of the Holy Spirit that He has now sent to live within us and to keep us in proper fellowship with Him. We have something they didn't have yet. Church, don't let this world offend you, as Jesus warned in verse number 1. Don't get disheartened. A lot of things going on. A lot of difficulties. A lot of uncertainty. And it's easy to get disheartened. It's easy just to give up, to throw in the towel. But may I encourage you this morning to keep on keeping on. God has given you the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, to live within you, to help you keep on keeping on. Tune yourself in with God through the direction of the Holy Spirit. Trust Him and obey Him and you will find yourself where you need to be. And more importantly, where God wants you to be. Who can you share that message with this week? Again, I said at the beginning as we looked at this message from Logan, 2% of the state. Here we live in the Bible Belt. We've got people that know more about the Scriptures. You know, not necessarily that they're saved, but, but they know. They ought to be easier to reach, amen? We don't have to start from the beginning. (laughs) We don't have to convince them that there is a God and that that Jesus did what He said. We just got to convince them to trust in that. So who can you share that with? Who's fallen away that you can reach out to and help bring back? God has given us the ability to do all that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What good is it if we're not going to use it? Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you again for this.